Hello, and thank you for joining us for day three of Architizer's Future Fest. To those of you who have attended one of our previous talks this week, welcome back. And if this is your first event, thank you for joining us. Future Fest, if you're not familiar with it yet, it comprises an epic series of 15 live talks with A plus award winners from all over the world, forming a vibrant celebration of architectural innovation. It's also our way of warming up for the 11th annual A plus awards, which launches next month. Stay tuned for more details on that a little bit later on. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Paul Keskis. I'm the editor in chief at Architizer. And today I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to chat with Sebra's uh, Mikael Frost, as he shares an extraordinary project with us and explains his vision for blending ancient and modern design in the public realm. Now, while we wait for the room to fill up, I want to encourage you all to say hi in the chat and let us know where you're from. It's always incredible to see such a global audience. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna run through a few quick pointers about, about this platform for you. So if you're having any technical difficulties with the stream, you can click on the help icon in the bottom left corner of your screen, and you'll see a few options for improving your picture, the sound, and so on. It's worth noting that there will also be a recorded version of the talk, so you can catch up on anything you missed or share this with your colleagues after the event. A thirdly, questions. You can type anything you like in the chat box, but if you have a specific question that you'd like to, like to ask Mikael, uh, we recommend you use the questions tab. Click on the questions icon uh, on the bottom right corner of your screen and then type your, your question there. And if you see a question from someone else that you'd be interested in hearing, you can upvote it and we'll, uh, we'll aim to ask Mikael uh, the most popular questions a little bit later. And finally, feel free to use the react button whenever you see something you like. Incidentally, if you'd like to learn more about FutureFest and see our full schedule of talks, you can find the full speaker schedule by visiting architizer.com and clicking on the top article that we've pinned there. And now I'm thrilled to introduce Mikael Frost. Um, Mikael is a Danish architect, artist, and founding partner of the internationally acclaimed architecture studio, Sebra, which he founded in 2001, together with Kolja Nielsen and Karsten Primdahl. Today, uh, Sebra has offices in our house, Copenhagen and Abu Dhabi, and has a growing international portfolio. Throughout the years, Sebra has designed several significant projects, both in Denmark and across the globe. Uh, among others, Experimentarium, the Iceberg, and not least, the comprehensive revitalization of the Al Hussein Master Plan in Abu Dhabi, which we'll be learning about today. Currently, the studio is also working on several ongoing projects in North America. As an artist, Mikhail Frost is well known for his skill to visualize and document his and Sebra's architectural works and concepts in drawings, sketches, and photographs. So, Mikhail, I'll hand over to you. What have you got in store for us today? Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, thanks for the chance to speak. It's really a pleasure to, to do this. Yeah, as uh, Paul just said, I'm going to talk about the Kasral Hassan uh, project today. And it was an international competition that we did some four or five years ago and managed to to win this commission. But before I get started, I want to just point out that um, the scope of this commission is, is, is massive because it ranges all the way from master planning and all the way down to interior design and detailing. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a commission that kind of, it, it, it holds all of the disciplines within architecture, I would say, in one, in one commission. Even so, we've managed to focus on uh, a few topics that kind of runs through the the entire uh, project and the work that we've been doing. And I'm not gonna go through the topics one by one, but I'm going to kind of mention them as I go along. It's got to do with heritage, of course, transformation, regional landscaping, context awareness, and, and uh, placemaking. Um, before I talk about the project itself, I think it's important that you understand a little bit about the history uh, of Abu Dhabi. And I like to start with this image that it's an aerial photo shot in 1954. And this is Abu Dhabi Island uh, with the way Abu Dhabi looked at the time. And all of the 
buildings that you see are the so-called uh, Bait al-Sahel. It's Arish houses uh, made from palm fronds, usually a perimeter building or a perimeter around an actual, an actual building inside of it. And then obviously on this photograph, one building stands out as the largest building and the only or at least one of few that's made out of coral stone, which is um, the fort itself, the Qasr al Hassan fort is in the lower right corner. And um, this is where the rulers of the country has been living uh, for centuries. The building was built in the 17th uh, century. And it was what you would see when you approached Abu Dhabi from the desert. You would see that magnificent building from afar as a kind of a landmark and you would kind of steer towards that in the direction of, of Abu Dhabi. And so I would say that even to this day, it's probably the most important building uh, of the nation, not the largest, but in terms of heritage and culture and, and essence, et cetera, this is the most important uh, building in the country. Uh, and it's been kind of developing um, over the centuries. It started out just being a watchtower. Then they built the first ring then the second ring, and it's constantly been modified. Lately, it's been called the white fort, but as you can see on the image here, it wasn't always white. So that's yet another moderation. It's been changing all the time. And then when the commission was, uh, was, came out, the situation was roughly something like this. You see the fort, you see the city of Abu Dhabi around the 400 by 400 meter plot. And then please note in the background, there's another building. That's um, the Cultural Foundation building. I'm going to be referring to it as the CFB. And that was built uh, in 1981. So in a way that's also heritage in Abu Dhabi because the country of the, the UAE is so young and so is Abu Dhabi, that is a heritage building. We call it modern heritage, whereas the fort itself is, is more of is ancient, um, ancient history. The Cultural Foundation building um, used to be um, a national library and a concert hall, a number of other facilities. And at some point, leadership in the country actually thought about uh, demolishing the building. But it didn't happen because many people in the country had sentimental values with this building. This is where you went to the first cafe. The Delma Cafe actually was inside of the CFB. Uh, many people remember their first school play here. Some people were even lucky enough to, to meet His Majesty Sheikh Sayed within this building. So it didn't make sense, of course, to demolish it. So um, the DCC uh, decided to uh, revitalize the building as part of master planning the area around uh, the fort and the CFB. So when we started sketching, we knew that we had these two magnificent buildings and we also knew that we had to kind of preserve them as being the icons or the gems of the site. So we divided, as you can see in the sketch to the left, we divided the site diagonally cutting from one corner to the other, creating this kind of a yin-yang kind of division of the site. And in the one side or in the one of the triangles, you find the fort on an open sand plain. We tried to reinstall it in the, in the setting of being an object on the sand plain, something that you could see from afar, just standing there in its own right, so to speak. And then on the other side, we kind of did the opposite with the CFB. We paved, or we had the idea we would pave that area we would plant palm trees in that area and we would keep it on the city grid because that's another detail that you might notice. The CFB is aligned with all of Abu Dhabi, the entire grid of the island, whereas the fort is rotated in the Kipla direction. So that is also something we could underscore within the landscape project. And then on the right side, you see different interpretations of working with a diagonal connecting the two streets. You can do that in many ways, but we ended up actually with number four. And with the division, we managed to connect two really important streets also in Abu Dhabi, the Hamdan and the Electra, along what our client called a desire line. That was in the brief, this desire line connecting the two corners. This is where you want people to kind of walk through the site, experience the two buildings. In the end, we began working with these Voronoi shapes. Voronoi is the last name of a mathematician. Um, you could also call them polygon shapes. And they kind of run along this diagonal, cutting from one corner to the other. And then, as I said before, the fort on one side, the CFB on the other. And you might notice on the sketch to the left that we also introduced the so-called water feature. It's a little canal or creek that runs all the way along the desire line and then culminates in a reflecting pool 
in, uh, in the upper uh, right corner of the site, the northeastern part of the site. Um, and it just kind of highlights the, the direction, the diagonal direction between the two buildings. And this system of, of Legos, in a way, uh, turned out to be very flexible throughout the design phases because, as you can see, it can be modified in many ways and can be a number of things. It can be a flat surface, it can be a plant bed, it could be a water base in a back of house facility. In the end, it became a food and beverage area and a mosque, etc. It's a very flexible, uh, elastic, almost uh, system to work with architecturally. Now, the ideas with the Voronoi shapes and the mud cracks has to do with the fact that Abu Dhabi Island is part of what we call a coastal desert landscape. It's really fun to travel from the coast and into the desert because at the coast, the sand is very pale and kind of beige or, or grayish. And the further you go into the country, the more red it gets slowly. And you also see the salt of the water mixing with the sand and creating these flakes or the mud cracks that we call them. And that's why we decided to work with that whole idea of the mud crack pattern. And you see it quite clearly on the building site image on the left, that even the buildings have the same color as the sand and the coastal desert. It, they seem to kind of grow out of the ground. So paving, uh, sand, uh, and the buildings, they have the same materiality, same geometry, same color. It's quite uniform. That has to do with the idea of preserving the CFB and the fort as the only buildings on site. Everything else should look as a landscape. So in essence, if you look at the watercolor to the right, you have the two uh, surfaces, the sand surface, the paved surface, the diagonal cutting through. And you can zoom all the way into the center of the site. You still have the three components and the diagonal. And this is the, the situation plan. There's one building I didn't mention. And um, I'm not going to be talking a lot about it, but I'm sure that you're so smart that you'll notice anyways, I better, I better uh, talk about it now. If you look at the left side of the situation plan, there are these ship-shaped uh, two buildings. And within the brief, our client stated, well, you have to, part of your proposal is actually saying, what are we going to do with these buildings? Should we demolish them? Should we keep them? How do you, what do you want to do? And the fun thing about this, uh, these two buildings today, they're called the artisan's house. It's a beautiful, beautiful building. It was supposed to be intermediate, but it's super beautiful. It's just in the wrong place. It blocks the view to the fort and it shouldn't be there. You actually want the fort to have a lot of space. But then on the other hand, it's also kind of a bad idea to knock over a beautiful building. So we made a scheme that would allow the client to keep it as long as they want. They can always take it down, but as soon as you take it down, it's never coming back. So for now it's there and it works well today as a exhibition space and, and um, events and other things. But still, the two important players on the side, the Ford and the CFB. So I'm going to go through the different components of the master plan. And I'm going to start with the, with the landscape uh, elements. Even though I talk about a yin and yang, which is a black and white division of, of a surface, it is in fact quite uniform. Everything is sand colored. So it's more about the sound when you walk. When you walk on the sand, you kind of hear it. When you walk on the concrete, you don't. The surface of the concrete is slick, the other one is not. But it pretty much has the same color of the coastal desert landscape. And even when you zoom in on the details, you'll once again find uh, the concrete made from the same sand color. And you'll see that most of, of, of the rocks that we are placing there are made from locally sourced natural stone from Oman. So it's Omani limestone and concrete throughout the entire site. And to avoid just creating a, de a desert and a space that could be difficult uh, in the summertime where the sun is, is very harsh uh, in this uh, part of the world, we sprinkled across the site what we've called pocket spaces. I didn't invent the word, but it's a little bit like a mini oasis. So when you're walking out there in the sun and you want a bit of shade, maybe you want to sit down for five minutes and send a text or you just, just relax and look at other people walking by, you can go to one of these pocket spaces. And they're all variations of the Voronoi mud crack pattern. So they're pretty much the same, but they have small little tweaks. Some of them have water, some of them don't. Some of them have trees, some of them and not so many. They have different sizes, etc. So it's also part of wayfinding uh, through the site. Today, 
The trees are bigger than this. These are images shot right after we finished the project today. I think they're twice the height. But I'm sure you can imagine that as these trees will mature, you'll have a complete ceiling of foliage just covering and creating shade for these seating uh, arrangements uh, across the site. And as you can see, when you look out under the trees, you find the open surfaces. And this is where you walk and you see the fort. In fact, the fort is hiding behind the tree on the left side of this image. Here's another pocket space. It looks slightly different, but as you can see, it's, it's interpretations of the same, uh, the same idea in a way. Here, I think in this pocket space, you walk down a few steps. So you're kind of subdued in the landscape, hiding a little bit. And then I mentioned before the water feature. It's, it's, it's almost like cracks in the paving in a way, or like little water canals. So that is a reference to the Arabic irrigation system called Falaj, which is basically leading water in canals out to the different palm trees and palms, um, which is something they do a lot in Align. And it builds up. So from the little cracks or the little canals, it becomes a reflecting pool surrounding um, surrounding uh, the mosque in the northeastern part of the, of the site. I've added these little diagrams in the upper left corner and you can see the blue color is water. So you can also see that there's a bigger part of the water in the northeast corner of the site. So you should keep an eye on those little icons up there. Yeah, so here's the mosque to the right. I'm going to be talking about that separately. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on it now. But if you look at this image, you'll see a so-called viewing corridor. We were given from the client a lot of viewing corridors, I mean, directions from which you should be able to see the fort. And this is one of them. And you can see the tower of the fort and it's kind of framed by the mosque and, and the food and beverage area, which is just outside of the picture uh, to the left. And you see that at this point, the water is very shallow, but it's wide all of a sudden. So I'm just gonna, talk briefly about the buildings. And I've already mentioned the fort many times, which is natural because this, this plot is all about the fort. We didn't work on the fort uh, at all. We worked on everything else but the fort. That was, uh, uh, that was done by DCT, the client, and uh, an architectural company called BDP with Arab and a number of other uh, people. We didn't work on that. But the thing is that when you work around the fort, you work with it uh, regardless and I think this image pretty much shows that, yes, we've created a tone of material and color that works well with the fort, but our landscape is precise and modern and slick and minimal, whereas the fort has tactility uh, and detail and ornament. So you definitely see what is new and what is old, and that's extremely important in order to respect uh, an ancient building like this, that you can clearly see what is original and what is added. And that is done through the precision and the building technique. But in fact, the, the, the color uh, works well together with the fort. So it's, it's creating a unity while not creating a unity at the same time. It's sort of a, a balance between, between those two things. And then, as I mentioned uh, before, the other star of, of the plot is the CFB. It was designed um, in the late 70s, I suppose, and they finished it in 1981. The lead architect was Hisham Akuri, and he worked for something called the Architecture Collaboration. So they usually say that it's a modern building with Bauhaus origins, because I think Walter Gropius actually founded this uh, TAC office. And it was a collaboration of, of many different architects uh, working together. Um, the CFB um, is quite a fantastic building and I didn't notice at first. I had to learn to to learn how to appreciate it. And, and then when I did, I kind of fell in love with it. Uh, and it's very simple. As you can see on this uh, diagram, we have the exploded axonometric on the left. It consists of three squares, three compartments. The central one is the entrance and the atrium. Then if you walk right, you have a music theater. You actually see the stage tower on the roof. It's an octagon. And on the left, there was a national library. We did a few moderations of the building, a few precise uh, moderations, but not too much. And that completely changed the whole idea and the perception of the building. One thing that we did, and you'll see it on the second from the top in the exploded diagram, we cut a little atrium through the building to allow daylight to filter down and to create an access to the roof where we built a roof terrace. That was one little thing. 
The other thing was to open the building on two sides because the image I just showed you was from the south and we needed it to be as open to the north so it doesn't kind of block the side. You can enter it from, from two sides symmetrically. And that's pretty much all we did apart from interior decoration. Um, I'll, I'll be showing you that as well. So here's the atrium that we cut to the roof. There was already a tunnel. So you have to imagine this space as a tunnel with the ceiling cutting across. So we just ex ex extended the space um, to, the, to the roof. And then around this atrium, you have a children's library today. So it's still a library, but now it's dedicated to children. And then daylight filters down into the children's library and you have a possibility, and this is completely public, to walk to the roof terrace and overlook the entire site and of course the fort, to overlook the fort, to look over the walls a little bit and maybe see a bit of what's going on on the inside. You can also, of course, buy a ticket and visit the fort and have a, a complete tour of that. This is the roof terrace. It looks a little empty on this. It's a photograph I shot while we were actually still building uh, on the project. Um, I have some photographs at the end of this presentation with more people. Obviously today it's, it's, it's packed with people having a good time up here. Um, and inside of the, of the CFB, we made the, a few installations. This is almost like a sculpture in a way. This is the comic book corner in the children's library. So children can read comic books here and they can compose comic books themselves with their iPhone and so on. But the, the, the thing is that if you just take this furniture piece and move it out, you have the original building. It's very clear to see that it's something that's been carried, almost carried into the building, placed on the floor, like an art installation. You can really take it out again. So I think it's done in a respectful way, even though the formal language is completely different uh, from the CFB itself. So once again, it's the idea of standing out in order to respect what was already there. So you can clearly see what is added and what is not. Then we had to design a couple of new buildings for the site. I've been talking about the existing buildings. We had to design underground parking. We had to design a food and beverage and a little mosque. I'll be calling it uh, the Musala uh, on and off because it's a smaller, that's a name for a smaller mosque. And both of those buildings we disguised as part of the landscape. So you can see in the little cartoon that I drew this one guy saying, what is it? Is it a building or a landscape? And, and the other person answers both, I guess, which is exactly the point. It is buildings, but it's also a landscape. And the idea is that if we can actually conceal all of the new buildings to be landscapes, then the CFB and the fort will remain the only buildings on the site. The other parts, the new things are inhabitable landscapes. And as you will see the images that, that comes now, it, you can see that it's not just a theoretical a claim it's actually the way we've designed it. It starts out pretty flat as you can see on the section on the on the right right hand side sketch. First it surfaces, then it's plant beds, then it becomes roofs over the over the food and beverage, and then in the end it rises to the minaret at the top. So it kind of builds up towards the northeast corner. That's where you have the, the water basin. I think this, this, this uh, photograph shows it quite clearly. The photograph to the right, in fact, is shot from the top of the CFB looking down. So it also gives you an impression of what you see when you're on the roof terrace. And as you can see in the bottom of the picture, it starts out pretty flat. That's an edge that will give you a, you know, a seating possibility. Then it builds up. All of a sudden, you can walk under these flakes, under the mud cracks, and you have a food and beverage area. And then in the end, you have the mosque with the minaret as the top point. None of this is taller than the, than, the, than the fort. All of this is kept lower than the fort, which is super important, of course. So this is the food and beverage that I showed you before from above. So when you follow the desire line going from one corner to the other, you'll be walking under these eaves, protecting you from the sun, have a coffee shop on the right, the water basin on the left, and you'll see the fort across the basin. And then you reach, uh, then you reach the, uh, the mosque. I've, I've included this image to, to really show you how landscape and building kind of melts together. It's difficult to actually see which one of these rocks is, is, is inhabitable. The small ones, of course, in the foreground are not, but it's difficult to see where building and landscape starts and stops. And then definitely in the background, you understand that the CFB is a regular building. So I think it proves the point that you can disguise or conceal a building as a landscape. The mosque itself is pushed out into the water basin. And we've done that for a number of reasons. First of all, we couldn't go higher than the fort. 
So in order to double the height of the mosque, we made the mirroring reflecting pool. Um, and also the way the, the light is reflected into the building gives you a kind of magical religious effect inside of the spaces with all the shimmering light kind of being reflected around onto the walls. And then the third thing that I think was, was a clever idea, I can say this because it wasn't mine, but to avoid fencing the mosque, because what you want if you're a worshiper and you're going to pray, you want privacy and you don't want people looking into the spaces, yet you want daylight. And sometimes you solve that by putting a fence around the mosque, but we really wanted to keep the open and public feel. So instead of putting a fence around it, we pushed it out into the water basin. So nobody ever walks uh, to look into the building. You always see it kind of from afar. So to preserve sort of the idea that everything around the two hero buildings on the side is a landscape, we had to pull the landscape into the buildings as well. So we recycled the shapes, the Voronoi shapes, we recycled the colors and the materials. We even pulled the water into the building. If you look at the mosque uh, in plan, you can see that it's a number of individual volumes. So each volume has a function. So when you walk into the first vol volume, you have the hall, then you walk to the ablution space, then you walk to the prayer hall. You can also know that it's symmetrical because there's a female section and a male section. If you look at the center of Voronoi, you see that horizontal division. So one side is, is, is for the females, the other side is for the males. Um, and then as you can also see, you enter it from the east because the rest is kind of pushed into the water. When you see it from afar, it's objects. When you come closer, you understand you can actually walk between the volumes and you walk in these kind of cleft spaces and you're not sure where you're going, but all of a sudden there's a door and there's only one and you actually enter the hall. And as you can see, you refine the Omani limestone, you refine um, the concrete blocks, the Voronoi shapes, etc. Some of it is upside down, but it's still a landscape. It's a little bit like walking into a cave and that's also something that we found interesting because it's a reference um, it's a reference to the prophet Muhammad who had his revelations in the Hira cage in the Hira uh, cave just outside of, of, of Mecca um, and then it makes sense of course with the entire with the entire plot this is the female entrance hall this is the male entrance hall you see in the bottom of the image how the water filters into the building and you also see the blue openings where daylight is coming in that is actually the bridges connecting to the other volumes. So these bridges are made from glass on the sides, on the top, and even the floor. So it becomes windows at the same time. So when you walk to another function, you actually pass through this glass funnel or tunnel in a way. And it also has like a symbolic uh, purifying effect that you kind of, you walk through water, then you get to the other volume. Then you reach the ablution space. This is where you wash your hands, your feet, your face to get ready for prayer. And then finally you enter in the prayer hall and you find a slightly di different look and feel in terms of color and material. You see it's a little bit warmer. This is all veneered, so it's, it's wooden Voronoise, but it's the same geometries, etc. Now, um, I have a little bit of a cliche ending, but there is always something good about cliches because usually they are cliches for a reason. And I think that the point, the point that I want to make is that um, the most important thing in a public space would be the people. And what interests people the most, that's other people. So if you want to know if you succeeded, you just have to go to your space or the place you made and, and see if people like to hang out there. If you actually find people doing things there, um, and you never know. I mean, you do your best every time, but you never know. It's a little bit like a musician. You try to write that hit song, but you never know if it's going to reach the charts. You'll find out later. But uh, I can say that this place is visited by many people. It's very busy and it's very lively. And it's really a pleasure to go there. And it's interesting because, because it's filled, full of people, you kind of forget a little bit about the architecture uh, around the fort. And that's really enjoyable. So if you look at the site today, many tourists obviously go to see, uh, to see this place, to see the Caswell Hosn Fort, to see what it's about. Uh, many school children uh, go to learn about uh, the heritage of Abu Dhabi, to learn about the country, et cetera, learn about the fort. 
And if you're in the site and you look out, of course, you see all the traffic uh, around the site, uh, buses coming and going and stopping and so on. So it's a fascinating place um, to be. The next image, which is the last image that I'm going to show you before we, we go to the Q&A section, um, is it's not a professional image, it's shot with an iPhone, but I just really like it because it, uh, it kind of, it, it encapsulates the whole essence of the site. Um, and for me, the essence, of course, is elevating uh, the fort and preserving the fort as the main player of the site. And you can, I think from this image, you, you really see that it's almost a pivotal point in a way. It's surrounded by Abu Dhabi. It's surrounded by, by our design and by the water basin. So it's really placed there as the center of things. But I also like to see the people just sitting there enjoying the sunset having a coffee or a tea, chatting a little bit. It's really a peaceful place to go. And I think it's, it's magical to be in a, in, a metropol, in a metropolis city like Abu Dhabi. And then all of a sudden you have this break, this kind of um, quiet place where you can just chill out and relax and, and, and enjoy, uh, enjoy the sunset, enjoy a company of other people. That is super nice. So anyway, this is, uh, I think I just, I made it exactly on time, Paul, which is <laughs> one minute over, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer uh, all of your questions and I, I hope I can, I can manage to do it in a, in a good way. Fantastic. Um, you just told the story so, so well. Um, it, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, I, I actually shared an article that I wrote about um, Zebra a few years ago in the chat <clears throat> halfway through because I, uh, I was reminded of your incredible sketches, um, which I wrote about a little while ago. So hopefully oh. if you saw that in the chat, you can enjoy a few more of those. Um, and yeah, I have a couple of questions of my own actually, but I'm going to start with a few from our audience and there's plenty of questions coming in. Um, so Camilla, um, Camilla asks, um, with Abu Dhabi being a relatively new city, um, how does blending ancient and modern culture impact the design process? Um, and how much of history is, um, influences the final result? And I guess um, you've spoken about the fort, but um, I wonder if, if you sort of can reflect a little bit more on the, on the, wider, the wider city and, and how that may have yeah. also impacted, um, impacted your choices. Absolutely. No, it's 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 uh, it's correct. It's really a young nation because it's it's well, it's younger than me. I was I was uh, born on September five in, in nineteen seventy one, and the UAE was founded on uh, December second seventy one. So by three months, I'm three months older than the UAE. So yes, it's a young nation. However, however, people have been living here for, I guess, thousands of years, at least hundreds of years. And the settlement that I showed you from 1950, but there's been people here forever. So the culture is much older than the country itself. Um, the country was recognized by the UN uh, in, in, in 71, but, but as I said, the city of Abu Dhabi, the watchtower, et cetera, is way older. Uh, and so obviously we were working in, in, in Abu Dhabi uh, years before we did this, or we were invited to this uh, international competition. And on my first trip to Abu Dhabi, I was so fascinated with the place that I packed my suitcase with books and I took a few of them uh, with me on the flight so I could read them on the way back. And I was just fascinated with all the stories. There's one book that it, it's a bestseller book. So I think many people that's been in Abu Dhabi knows it, but it's a really, really good book. It's called From Rags to Riches. Uh, I think uh, the author is called Mohammed Fahim. I think so as far as I recall. And it's, 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 really, it's really interesting because he remembers what I showed you on the aerial photos from the 50s and the 60s. He remembers traveling from Alain on Camelback to Abu Dhabi, traveling for three weeks. And as he describes, I think maybe it's on the blurb, now it takes him 45 minutes in a car with air condition, the same travel. So this is one person who's seen that transition within his own lifetime. And he's been part of building buildings in Abu Dhabi, hotels and other buildings. And so 
That's a good read. That's why I'm mentioning it. I think if, if you find this fascinating, that's a really good place to start. I've read the book. It was, it was the first book I read. And so to answer Camilla's question, yes, absolutely. We've been investigating so much in the culture of Abu Dhabi. And for me, I'd been working as an architect for 20 years when we started uh, doing the projects in Abu Dhabi. And for me, that was an injection of, I don't know what, because it was so inspiring that all of a sudden I felt uh, vitalized again as an architect because all of a sudden I had all of these new things to work with, the climate, the palm trees, the, the landscape, everything was completely different. So it was extremely inspiring. And I've been reading loads of books um, about the Abu Dhabi and the UAE. Super. Um, yeah, I think this kind of um, this kind of links to a question I had um, when you were um, showing the interiors, especially of the mosque. Um, and obviously, there are lots of very particular details that need to be included in in this kind of building. Um, yeah. And I was just wondering about um, how you collaborate or consult with um, religious leaders in in the local area, or you know who who helps guide. Um, guide the brief, if you like, for, a, for yeah. a, a, a building like a mosque, especially in, in a country like this? Well, first, before I answer the question about who, who guided us, I just want to say that for me, it's been, a, it's been really a surprise to see how informal uh, religion is in Abu Dhabi, because people will pray everywhere. It doesn't really matter. I've, I've actually seen people pray in the aisle of the airplane. And I was asking a friend of mine who's a Muslim, say, Is, isn't she facing the wrong direction? She says, yes, she's facing the wrong, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's not, it's not uh, I mean, it's important, of course, but it's not a big deal. And you have prayer rooms in every building. And sometimes it's just an ordinary space. It's just, you go in there and you pray. And then you have all the way up to the Grand Mosque, which is like a really spectacular building. And in between those two extremes, you'll find something like the Musala, uh, which is a smaller mosque. Uh, and it's an informal place where you can just drop in from the street. Uh, maybe you sit there for a while and you walk on, or you actually go to pray. You, you decide yourself. So when I started working on the mosque, I was a little, uh, I was a little uh, concerned because I was thinking, oh my, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm, I'm not a Muslim myself, and how am I going to deal with this? And I do I know enough? And everybody around me that I work with who were Muslim, to take it easy, it's, it's going to be fine, we're going to guide you, and here's a book about how it all works, and we read the book, and, and obviously there were many Muslims uh, on the team who could uh, direct us, and were eager to, to answer any question that we might have, and so we did it collaboratively with our client and the stakeholders and the, uh, the people working on us and so on, so it's, and in the end it's, it's, not, uh, it's not complicated, uh, there are a few rules you have to abide to, but most of them are actually quite practical and, and very easy to understand. Super. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Um, <clears throat> and then, yeah, a couple of more um, kind of practical questions, um, which I thought were really interesting here. Um, Aruju asked, um, could you speak to the natural and mechanical ventilation um, methods of, of these interior spaces? Um, I guess it's kind of interesting um, it being, you know, the climate that you have there um, in combination with these quite monolithic forms. Um, and, yes. and yeah, it'd be interesting to know like how, how you worked with, um, with other um, consultants, engineers and, and so on to make, to make all of that work. Yes. Um, as we are based in Denmark, we are not, uh, we need an AOR when we work in a place like Abu Dhabi and we work with GHD, who is an internationally, uh, like a really big international uh, company with engineers and architects and so on. Um, and those were the technical consultants. Obviously, and, and I suppose the question is directed at, at the Musala uh, specifically and not so much the CFB or the food and beverage area. Uh, we do have um, mechanical ventilation but it's all integrated and concealed really well. If you, I can go back, it's still on the slide, right? If we go to the prayer hall, you'll see that it's integrated in all of these Voronois, and you'll see that some of them have, have grills on the bottom. That's intakes and outtakes for the ventilation. So it all becomes part of the design. Um, but then, of course, we also try to, of course, avoid overheating. So all of the windows are shaded, as you can see, because they're in the gaps between the actual blocks. So there's not a lot of heat that actually goes into the building. 
and that uh, reduces uh, the, the need for cooling. So that's that's basically the idea, and it works well, of course, when you want the privacy as well. It's it's uh, two flies with 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 one go. Um, but yes, it's mechanically cooled, and we've integrated that within the the ceiling and the wall noise shapes that are suspended from up there. Yeah, it's uh, it's really clever. I mean, when you look at this image, uh, it's like you you oh. kind of produced an architectural magic trick. <laughs> um, in a way, it's so minimal and so clean. Um, <clears throat> and that kind of um, ties to another question, um, which Ella asked, which is um, with the very distinctive irregular shapes. Um, did that make it hard to integrate the building services? Did you have to? Um, yes. Did they have to be designed in a bespoke the way? Yeah, the, the simple answer is yes, it was difficult. Not, I suppose, not technically difficult because you have to abide by the rules of airflow and so on, which is basically the rules of physics in the end. But to really make it work and not to overcomplicate it and to and, and to make it look right, et cetera, yes, that was a lot of work. Um, but I mean, that's it's, it's always that way with architecture. You you aim for perfection and you you work and you work and you work and, and finally it's... It's never the, 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 you're never struck by lightning and you see everything. I suppose Mozart did, right? But the rest of us, we have to just work hard on it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, um, it's definitely always a challenge. And it's like, you don't want to compromise on the concept, right? For, for the sake of, for the sake of services, which are, yeah. you know, they're, uh, they're necessary, but um, but yeah, absolutely. I, I, I can imagine the, the tension there. Um, I'm just gonna, um, whilst I, whilst I think of it, I'm just gonna, um, open up a poll. Um, there was lots more questions, which I'm going to ask you in a second. Um, but I just wanted to point everybody towards the poll, um, the poll tab, which is on your bottom right hand corner. Um, we just have a little poll to ask people, um, if they're interested in learning about the upcoming A plus awards, um, this project was one of the highlights of um, last year's last year's A Plus Awards program. And um, we're welcoming um, new submissions uh, next month for the 11th annual awards. And who knows, maybe if your firm enters and you're victorious, you might be the one um, sitting in the, the hot seat today um, in this time next year. So um, if you're interested in a submission guide or in receiving updates about the program, um, let us know there. Um, so I'm just going to leave that open um, for the moment. But now I'm going to hop back to the questions. There are so many questions. It's actually hard to, <laughs> to choose, <laughs> uh, which is great. Um, let me see now. Um, <clears throat> Peter asked a couple of kind of inter interlinked questions, which is also a little bit, I guess, to do with services. But he he's wondering about um, the lighting choices and um, also if there was any kind of soundscape or any kind of um, audio um, speaker system that was needed for this kind of building? No, there is no audio in there, but I'll tell you a little bit about the lighting. Um, I didn't, I, I skipped that because obviously there's just half an hour, but anyways, some, there is artificial lighting. So those are the suspended bulbs from the ceiling. Then we have the bridges that also functions as windows. Those are the blue holes in the facade. And then we have very small circular skylights in the roofs. And I think if I go back, you'll see them from the outside as well. I just clicked to that image. Just give me a second. You'll see them right here. If you look closer uh, on the upper right hand corner, you'll see on the roof, the little dots, it looks like uh, star constellations. Those are in fact little glass holes pierced through the through the um, through the shell of, of, of the building and so what it means is that we have different light sources we have the bridges we have the artificial light and we have these holes and they kind of support each other during uh, the 24 hour of a day so in the nighttime you'll see these dots from above if you're in a, one of the tall buildings around you'll see them kind of as star constellations in the daytime you will actually receive the light but it mixes with the artificial light within so it's a mix of cold and warm tones together, which is the essence actually of the, of the space. It has the warmth of the coastal desert landscape, but it also has the cool soothing blue colors of the water in the floor that you see. Uh, maybe you can see it in the right side of this image. That's a water pool coming in from the outside and the bluish uh, daylight coming from the bridge in the left side of the image and the bluish light from the top. 
So it's all it's all changing during the day, and it's all a mixture of warm and and cool tones uh, fading together in a way within the space. That image, uh, yeah, the image of the interior with the the bridges connecting, um, I think was one of my absolute favorites. I I love the the color contrast um, between the warm kind of gold golden tones and that cool blue that you have. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah there's something really quite magical about that that definitely feels quite um, like nature, I guess you would say, like the water and the the sand um, in contrast. Um, and it, it's, <laughs> it's a classical it's a classical Arabic thing that you have the warm tones of the stone. And then sometimes you use bluish tiles, which is a cool color. So you have the contrast uh, both visually and physically with the water as well. Usually in a, in a square courtyard, you'll have like a water fountain in the center. So the water is always uh, essential, obviously, in a hot climate. Here in, yeah. in Denmark, where I live, it just, it's just falling out of the sky all the time. We don't <laughs> want any more water. But, and, and in warmer countries, it's, it's the other way around. Yeah, uh, I'm originally from from the UK, as you can probably yeah, tell. Yeah, you know about rain then. <laughs> I totally understand that. Yeah, um, hundred percent. So yeah, and um, Iris then um, has a question, um, which maybe links <clears throat> also onto the the materiality of the project. Um, she said, um, "How were the um, how were the forms constructed?" And um, I guess that kind of um, links with a question which I had about the materials for the. Yeah. for the cladding um were those were those um i'm not sure if it's concrete or stone or a combination um and and where were they sourced and how did you select it because it you know the 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 color matching with the fort is is quite extraordinary yeah okay so throughout the entire site we only have concrete and omani limestone and it so happens that the omani limestone looks exactly like the desert uh, coast sand i suppose it's somehow I'm not a geologist, but somehow it's composed of the same raw material, I, I guess, but it has the exact same color. Uh, and then the concrete um, is cast on site with, uh, with board marks, as you can see. I should go back to the construction site image, I suppose. Just a second here. Just let me scroll back. You'll get a little bit of the idea. Uh, that was far back, wasn't it? Yeah. OK, here it is. So you can actually see the forms built up by wood. And then obviously, actually you see in the, in the right side of the image, you can see the last, actually that's a minaret being cast and you can see the scaffolding around it and you can see uh, the form where the concrete is being poured into that. And that's how it's all made. And then the, the suspended bone shapes within the actual volumes, those are cast on the ground and then they are lifted up into the ceiling. Um, so they are kind of suspended like super heavy lamps, you might say. So it's not all cast uh, in one go. It's been um, it's been cast in, in in different pieces and then put together. Yeah. But it's it's a great way to build, I think, because the entire site, the paving, um, the bollards, the plant beds, the buildings, everything is made from the same material. It's a really nice uniform look, but it's also technically it's it's a great way to work. As soon as you find that one method, you just kind of go and you can concentrate on shaping things and working with the, with the pocket spaces and all of that. You don't have to invent uh, new technologies for every corner. I quite like that. And I like working with massivity, which is something that we don't do enough as architects today. If you go back a couple hundred years, architecture was massive. You would have massive timber. You would have massive rock, and you kind of stack that. Today, we built skeletons, and we clad it with thin uh, plates that are kind of it's kind of hollow when you knock it, right? Um, and within this project, we had a chance all of a sudden to work with massive blocks of Omani limestone, locally sourced, not, not shipped across the planet from China or whatever, but locally sourced. And that was just a fantastic experience. And I've been, I'm still trying to go back to working with more massive materials. It's also more durable and it takes less time and it takes less screws and glue and whatever. It's, you just cut it out of the ground and it's finished the blocks we got from Oman, the limestone, they were just driven onto the site and placed in the right position, and it's done. No more work. It's a, it's a great way to... And if you chip a corner, it doesn't matter. If you chip a corner, something that's built from plates, it looks horrible. 
It looks worn out. If you chip a corner of a massive stone, no problem. It's just patina all of a sudden, and it looks beautiful. Yeah. That's great. I didn't even consider <clears throat> consider that, but yeah, that's a very good point. Um, and this kind of also links with a question that Jordan asked um, about how these materials hold up in the climate. I guess like the limestone um, makes sense. Um, this con yeah. Does concrete like hold up in a climate like this? Does it need any? It, it, it does hold up in this type of climate. Some of the older buildings are actually cast with brackish water, and that's problematic. And I think for the CFB, uh, I think some of the concrete would also cast with brackish water, which makes the the reinforcement actually rust. And the way to to deal with that is to actually put a little bit of electricity into the uh, into the um, reinforcement that stops the the corrosion. I didn't invent this, of course. It's a known technology, and I didn't know about it, by the way. We, we hired experts, of course. But um, if you cast with real fresh water, and if you do it with the right uh, technology, it's really durable. But the thing here is that, of course, the sun is really harsh on the materials. It will break down, for instance, wood. But that's not the only thing you have to take in mind. Another thing you have to take in mind is that things get really, really warm to the touch in the summertime. So if you use too much metal, you can actually have burn accidents if people touch like a rail of metal or whatever. So it's not only about durability, it's also about actual temperature. So uh, unlike uh, working in, say, Denmark or Germany, there are fewer things you can work with here. For me, it's, it's not a, a, a problem, actually, to have uh, less opportunities. In fact, it's a, it's a good thing. It makes it easier to, uh, to decide on, on what to do. But uh, yeah, there, there are so many things to take into consideration. Obviously, too, um, this is something we know from my town. Uh, since it's a coastal area, you also have salt in the air. Uh, the, the humidity from the ocean also has salt. So that's another thing you have to take into consideration in terms of patina and durability as well. Um, and the moisture, obviously. Abu Dhabi, in certain times of the year, is, uh, has, has a, a high uh, level of moisture in the air. So it's it's um, it's it's complicated to work there, but but um, once again, we always work with 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 uh, with experts, um, and it's that's the fun thing about being an architect, I think, and also working outside of your own country is that there are so many things that you learn, and you can actually some of the things you learn you can bring back and use them uh, here, for instance, and and vice versa. Wonderful. Yeah. <clears throat> and I feel like with the, the way that climate change is progressing, you know, a lot of lessons that we're learning in, in hot countries are going to be more applicable in more places um, in, in future years. Um, Rodrigo is asking about the dialogue process with the municipality. Um, so I guess, yeah, it's interesting to know how you work with the, with the city itself for a, such a, such a large scale project like this and, um, and, and yeah, how, um, how how does that kind of conversation go? And also, mm -hmm. I'm interested in um, how maintenance for the project into the future um, works. And and um, um, do you feel like it's going to be in safe hands? You know, this beautiful this beautiful um, water feature and the landscaping. Um, is it going to look just like this in in ten years and twenty years time? Oh, that's a good question. I think I think. I mean, in general, when I look when I look at the the monuments of Abu Dhabi, they are extremely good at preserving them. They really keep them well, and they really keep them tidy. Um, so, I'm not so worried about this kind of falling to pieces. They they constantly repair things and 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 keep it very nice. But I think it's only natural that probably in time the use might change, and probably our client will say, "Oh, now we need a ticket office, or now we need." And then hopefully they will call us to, to do those moderations. But all buildings need to be updated once in a while to, to always be uh, relevant. Um, so it's natural for a building to change to a certain extent. But, um, oh, it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely in good hands. And, um, and we've been working with a fantastic client, the DCT of Abu Dhabi. Particularly, I want to mention Mark Coffin. Who's, uh, who's an architect working with, uh, with DCT and a brilliant architect too. And I think with, without him on the other side of the table, this could have not been possible because he, um, yeah, he was just, first of all, he, t he taught us a lot of things about how to work uh, in the region and the history of the region. 
but also to have somebody uh, on the client side who just totally understands even the quickest and dumbest sketch and just kind of gets it right away because he reads the music, right? That's been a fantastic uh, gift for us. Um, so we've been lucky in that sense to have Mark uh, on the other side of, of, of the table and a number of, I feel a bit bad about just mentioning him now because there's been so many uh, brilliant people working on this. You have to keep in mind that, I mean, I'm sitting here like it's my project, but there are thousands, literally thousands of people uh, participating participating in, in, in designing something like this, uh, my, also outside of my own, uh, my own office, on the client side, the contractor side, that was, it was built by Supin, super cool contractor. Um, so many skilled people uh, made this happen. And that's also why I think it's in good hands because everybody who was involved with this project, I think feels some ownership towards it, which makes me really happy. I, I think for me, it's much, it's much more interesting to do something together with other people than to kind of uh, seeing yourself as a master builder and then the rest of the team is kind of your your slaves right i don't i don't i don't quite like that idea i think it's fantastic to develop it uh, together and it's been so many uh, people involved also oliver heim on the other side of the table with the client and our stakeholders have been amazing we have a fantastic stakeholder on the project and she uh, she's really uh, clear-sighted when it comes to understanding architectural vision and so on. And in, in fact, I can tell you this little anecdote. None of the competitors in the competition actually got it right. We all kind of failed, but the jury felt that we were the team they could work with. So I think we won the competition not so much on the design itself, but on our approach to working with other people. Then, of course, there was the idea with the diagonal cutting through the side, which is actually on the screen now that you see it on the watercolor. That was always there. That was the first idea, but it looked so many different ways and we just couldn't get it right. And I'm so happy that our client was so clever to see that we, the first designs we did were way too uh, expressive and way too loud and kind of competing with the Ford and the CFB and they were super patient with us. And I happy, I'm happy they were because we were inexperienced in working in Abu Dhabi and probably a little too eager to, uh, to show what we could do. And so slowly, over a year or so, we kind of, we kind of landed things on, in the right level. So yeah, it's, it's been an amazing collaboration, I would say. Fantastic. I think that's, that's an amazing point to... <clears throat> to conclude on um that's the modern architect right that you yeah, know they is. used they used to be master builders they used to be controlling all controlling yeah. Uh, yeah. but now it's all about it's all about team and uh and yeah you can see you know the result um the result is fantastic so um yeah i, I thank you so much uh Mikhail. this has been absolutely fantastic um and i can't wait to see i can't wait to see what you design next and, and what um, what you construct next um it's going to be it's going to be so so exciting to see um just uh remind people um if you're interested in the a plus awards and you want to know more um i'll keep the poll open for another minute or two um so head over to to polls on the bottom right of your screen and and select an answer there um before you leave us today um and yeah um thank you everybody for for joining us and thank you Mikhail, for for telling this incredible story and for these amazing images um i absolutely love the photographs and those those awesome sketches um and uh yeah we look forward to seeing everybody um hopefully for our next talk uh, tomorrow when we'll be we'll be speaking with uh studio toggle who won our young architect firm of the year award um <clears throat> in the previous um a plus awards um, and we'll be talking a little bit more about projects in the Middle East um, as they're based in Kuwait. Um, so I think that'll be fascinating. Um, and yeah, until until then, um, I'll say goodbye. But um, thank you again, Mikhail. And um, yeah, we'll definitely uh, look forward to your next projects. It's a pleasure. I can assure you we've got really exciting things on the way that are still confidential. But um, yes, we can do this again some other time. <laughs> Absolutely. That'd be fantastic. Thank you yeah. so much. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks.